Hi, I'm Rogan Tokash from the Auburn University B Lab, and today I'm going to be teaching you how to do an field amitraz resistance test. So what am I talking about when I'm talking about amitraz? Well, I'm talking about the active ingredient of a Varroa-based product. So when we're talking about things like Apivar or Amiflex, these have the active ingredient of amitraz. Now, amitraz is extremely effective at killing Varroa mites, and it's been very effective for the last 20 years. However, continued reliance on amitraz and some beekeeping operations as the sole form of treatment for Varroa has started to lead to some amitraz resistance issues. And so I'm gonna be teaching you how to do an amitraz resistance test to see what kind of amitraz resistance levels you have within your operation. So why are we doing this? Well, if I'm gonna go out to my bees and do a treatment of Apivar, which has that active ingredient of amitraz, but I have highly resistant Varroa mite populations to Amitraz, then that treatment's probably not going to be very effective, and I'm not going to see very good mite drop down or mite kill. And so, why we're doing this test is to understand what our levels of Amitraz resistance are within our own operation and to see how effective those treatments might be and if we need to start using different active ingredients and rotating to try to get better mite control. So, now that you know a little bit of the background, let's get into the colonies. So before you do your field amitraz resistance test, you're gonna need a little bit of prep work. So for this prep work, what we do is we take a 32 ounce deli container cup, and we take a one inch by one inch square of Apivar. And so why we're doing that is that Apivar, of course, has the active ingredient of amitraz. And so we take that strip of Apivar, and we take a little bit of hot glue, and we glue it to the bottom of this deli container. You're also going to want to have your deli container lid, but you're going to want to have it with the uh, hard wire mesh. And I'll get to that a little bit later as why it has to be this hard wire mesh. But when you're doing your amitraz resistance test, what you're really going to be wanting to do is finding a frame that is suitable for an alcohol wash test. So if you've watched the alcohol wash test on our AUB Lab YouTube page, you're going to see that you're always going to want to find a frame, preferably with some open brood and larvae. These are the ones that are going to predominantly have the nurse bees that are more likely to have varroa mites. So just like we do with an alcohol wash, we're going to take that frame Always double check for the queen, but I saw her on another frame already. And we're going to shake those bees out into our tub. We're going to wait 10 seconds to allow the foragers to fly off. And then we're going to shake down and take a half cup scoop of bees, or roughly generally around 300 bees. We're then going to put them into our cup that we've made with our Apivar strip at the bottom. And then, this is why you need that hard uh, wire cloth, is because we wanna make this breathable. So we're gonna come over to our pre-established workstation. Another thing that we've already prepped is our way boat. And so we have greased a way boat with Vaseline. And we're gonna take four binder clips and we're gonna put them on the corners of this Amitraz cup. Then we're going to flip that cup over and we're gonna leave it there for three hours. So you might be asking, why three hours? Well, Dr. Rinkovich at the USDA B Lab in Baton Rouge, he's done this test multiple times and he's found that it takes about three hours for all of the amitraz susceptible mites to fall down. And so what we're hoping is happening is that all of the mites that are susceptible to amitraz, they're going to come in contact with that apivar strip, which of course has the active ingredient of amitraz, and they're gonna drop down and fall through this mesh, and they're gonna be collected on this way boat, and they're going to be stuck in that Vaseline. Now, after the three hours, the cups will be flipped back over, and we're going to do an alcohol wash. Any mites that we find in the alcohol wash are going to be thought to be amitraz resistant. Now another thing that I like to do just to help me keep track of time is that I like to check my time on the clock and I see that it's just past 12 and I write down the time that we put the cup and flipped it. I also put the colony number. So this allows me to keep track of the three hours on when I need to flip that cup over, and it also allows me to keep track of which cup this colony came from. You'll also notice that I had the way boat, and I numbered the way boat as well. So after those three hours, we'll show you what happens when you, do, uh, when you need to flip those cups back over. 
So now that it's been three hours, let's flip this cup back over. So these are the mites that have fallen during the three hours. So these are the varroa mites that are thought to be susceptible to amitraz. As you can see from this colony, we have a decent number. If you compare that with our other colony, you can see that we don't have any varroa mites in this colony, which is a very good sign and means that we have generally low mite counts, hopefully, in that one. But we still need to do the alcohol wash. So it's time for us to do our alcohol wash. If you want to see how we do a triple rinse method alcohol wash, please reference another video on our Auburn University B Lab YouTube page. So it has just been three hours, we flipped the cup, and we conducted our alcohol wash. In one of our samples, we actually found a decent number of varroa mites. This is not ideal because these are thought to be amitraz resistant varroa mites. Generally, when we have do these amitraz resistance tests, we collect all the mites, whether they're susceptible or resistant, and we send them to Dr. Rinkovich, and he's able to do genotyping to determine the resistance allele frequency, and it helps back up whether our field results are actually what he's seeing in the lab. So now I'm just going to collect the mites from the Weibo because we're collecting both resistant and susceptible mites. I usually like to do an initial count on the way boat, but then I also like to count the mites as I collect them. And here you can see, this is why it's important to put petroleum jelly down. This mite is still moving its legs, and if you don't have enough Vaseline in the way boat, it could have crawled out. So now that we've collected all the mites in the tray, and all the mites in the wash, I'm gonna add that to the data sheet, and then I'm gonna calculate the total number of Varroa. To get our apivar efficacy, we take the total number of the Varroa in the tray, divided by the total number of Varroa in this entire sample. So this is one of our sample amitraz resistance Varroa data sheets. As you can see, we normally in on yards sample 10 total colonies. So here we have our start time, and then three hours later we have our end time. And so fortunately, we didn't see any mites in colony number two. And so that's really good for us as a beekeeper because it means that we have low Varroa mite counts. But it's not very good for amitraz resistance sampling because we don't know what our amitraz resistance levels are because we never saw any mites. Now if you compare that to colony number one, we had quite a few Varroa mites. So we haven't counted all of the bees in the sample so we don't know what our Varroa infestation rate is. But if you divide that by three, if you assume that we have 300, that's a pretty high number. Now, when you're looking at the Varroa in the tray, we had 24 versus 13 in the wash. If you divide 24 by 37 that, and multiply it by 100, that gives you almost 65% apivar efficacy. This is just under the threshold. So when we're looking at our results and taking everything into perspective, it's not ideal that we only saw roughly 65% apivar efficacy. In general, we're looking for efficacy over that 70%. And why we consider 70% as a threshold, if you have amitraz resistance over 30% or apivore efficacy under 70%, that's generally the threshold where you start to see that amitraz-based products are no longer going to be very effective in that colony and overall potentially in your operation. So what you're going to want to be doing at that point is switching up your active ingredient. Right now, we're sitting in January, and so it's probably not best for us to put apivar strips into that colony because we're not going to expect very much mite knockdown, and we're gonna be naturally selecting for those amitraz-resistant varroa mite populations. Right now, for us in Alabama, we should be considering something else, like potentially as we bounce back with more brood, maybe doing some kind of formic acid-based product like Formic Pro, because that's gonna be able to hopefully give us some proper mite knockdown while still not actually increasing our amitraz resistant level numbers. When you're doing these tests just in general with amitraz resistance, it's really important that you have a high number of mites to be able to tell your amitraz resistance levels, which is why of course we recommend doing it right after honey pull when you generally have more mites. That's gonna be able to allow you to know your amitraz resistance levels a little better. And we generally like to do this just on a subsample of some of their colonies in the operation. We find that these results are pretty homogenized across the entire operation.
So now that you know how to do an amateur field test, I encourage you to go out and do this with your own bees. This is really going to give you valuable information and it's going to be able to tell you whether Apivar or an amateur based product is going to be effective within your operation. <laughs>